Haven't shot one of these in a while. Hey everyone, welcome back to the second episode of Secrets to Stylized Hair. In the first one, we did a very basic hairstyle with Hanzo. And this one, we're going to get a little more in depth. I wanna jump right in, but there's a few things we have to do for housekeeping really quick before we get started. One, the first part of this video is gonna be mostly using curve brushes in ZBrush to create the hair. And we're gonna look at it a little bit, but we're not gonna go super in depth. So if you want a really in-depth look at how to create IMM and curve brushes in ZBrush, I have an entire video for that that I'm gonna link above and you can check those out. Number two, the curve brushes that I'm using are some very, very simple brushes that I made for the purposes of this video. They're the most basic kind of hairstyle curve brushes you could probably use. If you wanna download them and kind of have your own go at this sort of style, I've put a link in the description below where you can go ahead and download these and play around and do whatever you want with them. They're yours for free. And lastly, we're going to build on that first video about stylized hair. In this one, we're actually going to take it out of ZBrush, UV it, texture it, and render it in Marmoset Toolbag 4. So this is kind of like a whole process. Again, it's not a very complicated hairstyle. It's pretty basic, all things considered, but I think it's a great look at how to build hair and what are some of the things you need to think about when creating hair for rendering and real-time rendering. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Now, like I mentioned, we're using a very simple curve brush pack that I've put together for this video. You can see we have about six different curve brushes that we can choose from. And these are what we're gonna use to make our hairstyle. Now, one more thing before we jump in, when you're creating a hairstyle in ZBrush, I really recommend that you first just block out a rough shape with uh, just a sphere or you know simple geometry, just kind of bash it in there. We're skipping that part, but you can clearly see it in this video that I've taken basically just the scalp, I extruded it, and then just started pushing it around to get a really rough blobby version of, of the hair that I think I wanna go for. And that's gonna help us place our curve brushes down. You really wanna have something like this because your curve brush will magnetize to the surface that you are drawing your curve on. And so you really want something to use as a guide. So I'm gonna go ahead and load my curve brushes in the brush menu. And you can see when I choose my curve brush, we get a menu up top that has different versions of this brush. And we're just gonna stick on the first one. I'm gonna go ahead and basically going to draw a stroke along my reference mesh, and that's gonna put down the curve. And then once you're happy with it, you can just tap off an empty space uh, or go up to the curve menu, delete curves, and that'll actually finalize your curve and make it a piece of geometry that you can then edit. Once you finalize that curve, what you'll notice is that the new geometry that you've just created will actually still be part of the same subtool as the reference mesh that you were drawing on top of, and it'll mask out that reference mesh. And so you have a couple of choices uh, in terms of what you wanna do. You can just leave it all together and have separate poly groups. Um, you could go ahead and control shift click the reference mesh and then do a split by hidden so you break them off into their own subtools. It's really kind of up to you how you want to work. I go back and forth. Sometimes I split them up. Sometimes I keep them together. Just kind of find what's most comfortable for you and what you think uh, is the best for your organization. Because when you're doing hair with curve brushes, it can quickly add up to lots and lots of geometry. And so whatever works best for you to kind of stay sane and keep things uh, organized, I definitely recommend that workflow. Another thing too, is that you can adjust the depth of the curves. So for example, when you draw a curve on your reference mesh and you notice your geometry is floating way above your mesh, and you're like, oh, that's gonna be a pain in the butt. I really want it to sit lower. You can go to the brush menu and scroll down to see depth and you can change the embed value. And what that's gonna do is that when you draw your curve, it's gonna sit your mesh lower down rather than floating way above. You can even have it go underneath like if you know that your reference mesh is too big and you want your brushes to sit lower or you can have them sit higher, kind of up to you. And that might depend on if you actually intend to use your base blobby mesh as like a volume underneath your hair curves and you just want your hair curves to add a little bit of extra pizzazz. Or if you're going to replace your reference mesh completely with hair curves, then you might want them to sit more closely or inside the surface. Another benefit to having them stay all as one subtool is that then once you kind of have everything blocked out, you can just use a really big soft move brush and move all of the curve brushes around at once to help kind of push in and adjust the shape. Like I found when I was finishing this piece, her hair was getting way too big. And so I had them all merged together so that I could just kind of move them around and get everything closer to her skull. Cause it looked like she had this really, really wide poofy hair. Uh, and that just helped me a lot. If you are keeping the new geometry as part of your reference mesh subtool, 
You can use uh, masking to isolate and then use your move tool to push things around after you put that curve down. You can also use the move topological brush, which will isolate your movement uh, action on just the geometry that you're selecting and not other geometry in the same subtool. So it's really, really useful. Um, so you have some options there that you can use. And I just want to say that's the important thing uh, about curve brushes. Don't worry about getting your stroke absolutely perfect because you can go in and then just edit that geometry as you would any other piece of geometry in ZBrush after the fact. So I'll get it good enough and then I'll use my move tool to push it around, make it bigger, make it thicker, uh, even out the curve, that sort of thing. So um, just a lot to think about there in terms of how you work. Overall, there's not a science to this and most likely your first hairstyle or your first handful of hairstyles uh, might just be wasted work or they might just be a learning experience because it's all about like flow and figuring out the size of the shapes and that sort of thing and figuring out what works best. Um, and also obviously the curve brushes that you're using are going to greatly, greatly influence the style of the hair. So you want to either make or find curve brushes that fit the aesthetic or the look that you're going for. So find good reference and maybe a target of what you're trying to achieve when you're learning this kind of workflow. Like I mentioned before, it can be really hard to get these perfect just when you're drawing the strokes. And so doing things like using your move tool to move those tips around and really get them in a place where the part of the hair is um, and just tweaking the ends and the overall curve and shape with your move brush is going to help you a lot and just make it a little bit a little easier to work with instead of trying to constantly get those curves just perfect when you're thinking about how to structure your workflow in hair in this style think of it exactly the same as anything else that you would sculpt in zbrush start with the big shapes and then work down to smaller shapes so don't get over detailed or hyper focused on one area first think about the larger shapes of your hair and do that all the way around and then kind of look at if it's too samey or has patterns or something and then you can kind of tweak those and then add a second layer of like breakup and things that kind of add more life and personality to the hair and then you can go even smaller and add like flyaways and things like that at least that's what i did with this style now different brushes and different aesthetics are gonna have different goals but with these brushes and with this particular character that's how i started big shapes medium shapes and then the small shapes um, if you go straight to the small shapes, it's going to get really unorganized and really messy and it's going to become uh, hard to work with. So uh, that's definitely something that I recommend when thinking about how to structure this kind of hair. At this point, I'm really just focusing on some of those smaller flyaways, getting them to intertwine with some of my bigger hair curves and just trying to add interest and overall variety. Now. In the case of this piece that we're watching today, I know that I'm going to do a very specific angle. This is just for a still image render. So I'm not focused on every angle or everywhere else. Now, if you're doing this as a game character or a character where you want to present for multiple angles, you want to take more time to really make sure that your hair looks good from anywhere you look at it. I know that I'm just going to do this like cutesy front on uh, angle that she's going to be blowing a kiss at the camera. So that's what I'm focusing on in terms of making it look good. Now let's talk about UVs. So in ZBrush, you can obviously use the Z plugin UV master and just do an auto UVs and be like, bam, there's my UVs. I don't want to worry about it. Uh, let's move on. And you can see here, here's an example where I've done that. And for the most part, it worked okay, but you can see there is some weirdness that we could probably figure out and make sure it works okay. But because I want to texture this and because I want to know that I want to make something like a direction map or a flow map and do some other things to it, I really want more control over my UVs and I want to make sure that my UVs are organized and orderly, primarily because I want to know what ends are the top and what ends are the bottom of my pieces. It's just going to be easier to texture. And so I'm actually going to hand UV this and I'm going to do it in Maya, but you can do it in Blender or Max or whatever software that you're comfortable uh, UVing in. And uh, another thing too about having good curve brushes is that I'm actually going to use my low res curve brush geometry for my low poly. So um, ideally, when you create your curve brushes, don't create curve brushes that immediately have high density. Make them low so that you can use those for your low poly mesh. Um, in this very specific case, I am going to subdivide them one time and use that as my low poly just because it is for a static render. 
and I can have them be a little bit more smoother. I could also just leave them low and do a subdivide within Marmoset, which it does let you do, but um, just for sanity's sake, I'm just going to export them one subdivision higher, and that's going to be my low poly, but you can go ahead and do what works best for you. Now, one more thing I want to mention, and we'll circle back around to why at the end of the UV segment, you're going to want to export with an FBX rather than an OBJ with these specific curve brushes because I am using creases in ZBrush to hold their stylized geometric shape. And if we export as an OBJ, when we go back to bring it into ZBrush, we're gonna lose our creases and that's gonna give us a headache when we wanna subdivide for our baking. Uh, so just keep in mind that you're gonna to wanna to use an FBX which will retain crease information. And you'll see how that is translated to the viewport in Maya uh, in a minute. Now we're not going to spend too long on UV in Maya. You can see that I've gone ahead and imported the version with UVs from ZBrush to give me somewhat of a base and see how bad it is. But really I'm going to just start from scratch and start UV in. And as you can kind of imagine, this isn't like a fun process. It's pretty tedious. And the more hair curves that you have, the longer it's going to take because you need to UV each one of these individually. And I'm just going to show you my general workflow on a few, and then we're going to skip ahead to the final result so that we don't spend too much time here because it's not that exciting. It's basically repeating the same thing 30 times until we're finished, uh, and I'll save you that. So what I like to do is I like to isolate the piece that I'm working on. So you can select the geometry that you're working on in Maya, hit Control-1, and that's going to isolate selected. And then you're going to hit Control-1 again, and it'll unisolate and bring us back to everything unhidden. So I'm just isolating with Control-1, and then I'm gonna bring up the UV menu up top there in the poly modeling toolbar. Hopefully you're somewhat familiar with UVs in Maya. If you're not, I'll try to explain a little bit about my process, but basically what we're gonna do is we are just doing a super basic planar UV map so that we know there's no seams. I'm gonna go into edge mode and select the edges that I want to be my seams. And then I'm gonna do shift cut uh, in the marquee menu within the UV panel so that I get some seams and then we can just unfold both of the two pieces that I'm going to create. And then we can do a cleanup or uh, an optimize on the UVs. But yeah, basically I'm planar mapping, selecting the edges, cutting, unfolding, stacking. And then once I'm finished, you can see I have this chaos of UV islands and I'm gonna just apply a basic checkerboard so that I can scale them all to have roughly the same textile density. And then I'm gonna scale them all down and position them in my zero to one UV space that we can then export and bring it back into ZBrush. Circling back to around what I was saying in the beginning, I forgot about the creases and I UV'd my entire low poly hair with an OBJ that I exported from ZBrush to Maya. You can see in the viewport here, the left one is the one that I unfolded and the right one is an FBX. And you can see the FBX has these really thick blue lines because the FBX actually remembers the creases from ZBrush and is able to bring those into Maya. So I messed up and I have to go through now and use the transfer attributes component function to transfer my UVs from my OBJ mesh to my FBX mesh. So that way I can export this FBX mesh back into ZBrush and then have a mesh with my UVs in ZBrush and I can subdivide it with the creases that my curve brushes had and get a good high poly. Um, if you don't need your high poly to have the UVs, don't worry about it. You, you can skip this, but because of my workflow and how I was operating, I knew that I wanted to have my high poly still have UVs just for sanity's sake. Uh, so make sure that you are using a export method like FBX, ensuring that your creases are still active so you don't lose those. Now that we have our low poly and our high poly, we're going to bake in Substance Painter. We could also bake in Marmoset. You can bake in whatever you're comfortable with. The process and the theory behind baking is roughly the same. Um, I intend to do a more in-depth baking guide in the future. If you guys are interested in that, let me know in the comments. But we're going to use Substance Painter, mostly because Substance Painter actually updated their baking to be more visual based recently. And uh, they did a really good job. The baker already was a very good baker and painter. It just was a little less intuitive than Marmoset because you didn't really have a viewport to see what was going on. But now they've added an actual viewport and it's very, very good. Um, I continue to be really impressed with the progress I've been making with Painter. It's such a great piece of software. First, we need to make our project. And for stylized stuff, now we can get into a debate, and I'm sure some people will say some stuff in the comments, 
I like to use spec gloss, PBR spec gloss for stylized stuff because with the spec gloss workflow, you can add color to your spec, which just kind of lends itself to stylized work. Like if I want to push something a certain way, I can color my spec. Now, if you want more physical, realistic materials, you should use metal roughness. But since it's a stylized and I like breaking things and messing around, I'm using spec gloss and that's what we're doing. You can go ahead and use the workflow method that works best for you. So that's my template. From there, we just go ahead and load our mesh that we're going to be texturing in the file. We can go ahead and hit OK, and we have our 3D viewport on the left hand side, and we have our UVs on the right hand side. Very intuitive. So let's go ahead and bake our maps so we have something to start texturing. You can see there's a little croissant up in the top right. And if you click the croissant, it will bring up a whole separate menu, which is the new baking menu in Substance Painter. The menu is pretty self explanatory if you're familiar with baking at all, so we won't spend too much time in here, but you have to choose your output size for your textures. So I'm choosing, so I'm choosing 2048. I think that's going to be fine for us. Uh, dilation is the amount of edge padding that your textures will have. So if you're going to be like mip mapping or something, you want there to be extra space. Otherwise, you're going to see seams. So um, 32 is probably fine, but the higher resolution you go, you might want to add a little bit more padding uh, based on that. And then we have to load all of our high poly meshes that we're going to be using as our sources to bake down to our low poly. Uh, I just have everything merged together, so I'm just going to go ahead and load what you can see here is my hair underscore HP. And that's my high poly version of my hair that we will be baking. If you want to use a cage or you have a cage mesh, you can load that at this point too. Um, but for the most part, just playing around with the max and rear uh, distances usually works okay in Painter. Um, but if you're getting weird baking errors, sometimes you want to play with those to see if they can help alleviate it. This is the one strength that I think Marmoset Baker still has over Substance Painter is you can actually go in with a paintbrush and like paint specific areas of your cage to help alleviate any weird baking errors that you have. Uh, but Nonetheless, it's a, it works really well, and usually you don't have issues. And sometimes when I'm lazy, I work around those baking errors, which we'll actually look at in this. I'll show you how I just kind of hide some nastiness that I didn't feel like messing around with to uh, get the best result. We can also go ahead and choose the anti-aliasing. Uh, that's just going to kind of give you a smoother result. It's also going to increase your baking time. But this thing bakes so fast, we really shouldn't have too many issues. And lastly, we have to choose what maps we actually want to bake. and so. I'm just baking the gamut of maps just in case I want to use them all. Uh, the normals, the ID map, AO, curvature, position, thickness. Um, and having all of these maps, like especially curvature and position, are going to help some of the generators in Substance Painter to um, create effects that you want while you're texturing. Like for example, if you want to be able to use a gradient in Substance Painter, you need a position map so that it knows how to generate that gradient. Um, so those are all very useful. Curvature map will help you isolate areas like your cavities and your edges. So that's also a very useful map to have. All of these help to texture our model. So there's no reason not to bake them because the amount of time they take is fractional. Once we have everything, we can hit bake selected and it's going to take a moment to think and it's going to bake our maps. You're going to see it working. And then what we need to do is go ahead and close that menu. And on the right hand side where your layers are, you want to go to texture set settings. And you'll see all of the inputs for our maps. If they're not already loaded in there, you can go ahead and select each category and choose your normal map, choose your world space normal, your ID, your AO. And that's just going to make sure that Substance Painter is reading all of your maps correctly. Now that we have all our maps baked, we are pretty much ready to go to set up our Marmoset scene. We are missing one map, and that's a directional map uh, or flow map. You might have heard them uh, referred to in either name. Now, in order to understand what directional or flow maps are, let's go ahead and jump over to the computer so we can take a closer look. So we're missing one additional map, and that's what's called a flow map or a direction map. I'll be honest, there isn't a lot of really great information about these online. There's some older videos and some different ways to create them in different programs. Uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, this video is not going to change that. I'm just going to show you what I learned to be able to make them. I think what makes them sort of elusive is that none of the major software packages really support or promote the creation of flow maps. And that's because they're pretty niche. They're used mainly to fake movement of like water and rivers and stuff like that through a, a normal map trick. 
or using them for our case here, which is for hair cards. Now, I believe the definition of a flow map or direction map is a fixed world space normal map. Uh, I could be wrong, please correct me in the comments, but we're basically just hijacking our normals to present our specular in a certain way that is appeasing or more visually correct to how hair looks for us. There's a couple different ways that I've seen how to make these. Substance Painter does have some documentation on how to create flow maps in Painter. I tried it and I didn't have a lot of success with it, so I decided to look elsewhere and I found two possible alternatives. One is in a program called Mari, which I've never used before and seemed kind of intimidating. The other is in the free open source Photoshop-like program, Krita. So if you don't have Krita, you can download it for free on their website and that's what we're gonna use for this part of the video. Now, we're not gonna get super involved in the Krita. If you open it up and take a look, you'll see it's pretty much like Photoshop. You've got layers and adjustment layers and your paintbrush and different things. So. I actually found that it looked pretty intuitive in terms of just picking up the basics, but we're just going to hone in on what we need to create our flow map. So you're going to want to import either your normal map or your UVs into Krita just as a base so we know where we're painting our flow map. This is just going to give us a guide to work with as we paint. Now, this method is used in some other videos I was able to find online. The only problem is that it seems like most of those videos are a few years old and since those videos were made, some things have changed in Krita. Uh, and some like presets and things seem to be no longer where they are or they're just gone from the program altogether. And so I had to kind of troubleshoot to figure out how to replicate some of those old presets that Krita had. And so that's what we're going to set up. So if you go ahead and look up top, there is a brush menu uh, and you'll see there's a little squiggle with some dots and that's going to open up the brush setting. So if you go ahead and click that, we can basically modify or create brushes in Krita through all the different brush settings. So we're going to look at the preset panel on the left hand side by selecting the drop down. We're going to choose the tangent normal brush and this is going to be the normal brush inside Krita. And by default, it's just like for painting normals, like you could paint a normal map theoretically with this brush. Uh, I haven't tried it myself, but that's what it's there for. So we're going to go ahead and modify this brush to get the result that we need. The first thing we need to change is how the brush reacts to our pen. And so you'll see a subsection called tangent tilt in the middle there. And we're going to go ahead and select that. Now what you'll see is that there's a sphere that kind of represents what your brush is doing. And you can see by default, it's a normal matte brush. You'll see in the tilt options, there's a couple different ways we can have our pen control the brush. By default, it's on tilt. And while this is pretty cool, it's actually kind of a pain to actually use because it, it it works off the tilt of your brush. So if your hand is like really extreme at a really extreme angle, it's going to change how that brush renders versus if you were just tilted a little bit or in a different direction. And so that's going to be too much for us and we want to simplify it. So we're actually going to set it to direction instead. And once we change the direction, you'll see that it basically sets the colors to what I guess I would say looks like an object space normal map. I don't know if that's what it's actually doing, but it's going to work for us, I promise. Next, we're going to do some things that I think ultimately are kind of optional, but kind of creates a smoother, better stroke when we're painting our flow map. So we're gonna go back up to brush tip and we're gonna go ahead and set the brush ratio to 0.5. So basically it's gonna create an oval brush and then I'm gonna rotate it 90 degrees. And lastly, we're gonna go down to rotation and I'm gonna turn on drawing angle. And that's just gonna kind of give me a oval brush that smoothly follows my stroke. Uh, and creates a pretty clean result. Now, really all that's left to do is to paint. The thing to keep in mind is that whatever direction our stroke goes in is gonna impact the direction of our highlight once we actually apply this map to our model. So you wanna start from the top and go down and you wanna keep that consistent. So every stroke we make is gonna be top down across every hair strand on our map. I think likely you wanna try to make your brush as big as possible when you do this because these strokes and the lines that naturally occur between your strokes will have an impact on your map. Maybe there's an effect there that you're trying to achieve that you could play around with and see if it helps. And you'll also notice too, when you finish your stroke, you can get like a, a red dot at the bottom that could cause some visual error. So you kind of need to play with getting a clean stroke. Um, you could also apply a soft blur or like a Gaussian blur at the end to just kind of smooth everything out. But yeah, really all that's left now to do is paint. And so this is why it's important to know the direction of your UVs, because if some of our UV islands are rotated upside down and we're painting from top down, we're going to see the spec act differently on that hair strand than on the other hair strands. We want to be as consistent as possible. 
in our UV direction when we're doing this. Now you can see if we jump back over to Marmoset, if we just have the anisotropic property on on our material, by default, the highlight is going in the wrong direction and everything looks a bit messy. But if we go ahead and apply our direction map, we suddenly get order where the spec is rolling evenly across all of our hair strands and we're having something that looks a lot more like hair. Now I know that's not super in depth, but this was the best workflow that I could figure out for creating flow maps. Uh, it would be great if there was more official support with other programs, but this works for what we need to do. So now that we have all of our maps, let's go ahead and set up a basic scene in Marmoset so that we can start texturing. Now with Marmoset, if you've never used it before, it's a very intuitive piece of software and a very simple piece of software to set up. It's not like learning Unreal or something like that. It's very straightforward and it's built for artists to quickly get results uh, with their assets. So. We're just gonna go to File, Import. We're gonna import all of the geometry, all of our low poly geometry that we want to actually render and look at. And the first thing I'm gonna do is choose the little gear in the top right of the viewport, and I'm gonna turn on Show Guides. And that's gonna make this mustache man visible. And this is important because uh, the scale in your scene does matter for ray tracing and for some certain things like subsurface scattering. So you want your model to roughly be the size that they recommend. And so I'm going to scale my model up and just kind of position him where his head is. You don't need to position him, but I just do it just to kind of make sure that my character's head is the same size roughly to Mustache Man. It doesn't need to be perfect, but uh, you want it to be close so that everything works correctly in Marmoset. On the left hand side, we have our hierarchy. Your hierarchy includes your render settings, your lights, your camera, and your meshes. So everything you need to have a successful scene is in that menu. And you can see that we have sky. So the way that lighting works in Marmoset, you have a basic sky in IBL uh, that is going to cast light all around on your model. You could turn the brightness of this down all the way and just use spotlights or point lights. Um, but usually it's nice to find a skylight that gives you kind of the mood that you're going for. And then you can accentuate the lighting with those using uh, key lights and things like that. It's up to you how you want to work, play with it. In my case, I am going to use a skylight. I'm just going to go ahead and hit library there in the bottom right and find a uh, image that I think kind of works for the mood. I'm going to go through different iterations trying to find what works best for me, but um, this will at least get us started and get our scene uh, set up. So I found one that's kind of like grayish pink, and I think that it's good enough for now. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that. Now you can add lights a couple different ways. Usually the way I add lights is you can see that in the bottom left there, we have our image. And if you click anywhere on that image, it's going to create a light and sample the color from that space. Um, but you can change it. Don't worry about it. So you can just click down there. It's going to create a light and you'll see in our sky on our hierarchy, it's created a light underneath it. So now we have a light that we can play with. So I can go ahead and click that light, position it in 3D space, the same as you would in any other program. Um, you can also change it to world space so that it's a little easier to manipulate. You'll see that up in the top toolbar there. And then we can adjust the brightness, the temperature, the color, uh, what kind of light it is, all in the options for that light. So take some time to look up and down that menu and see the different options for lights. I'm mostly going to be using spot spotlights. Also note that you can adjust the diameter of the light. The diameter is going to be like the softbox of the light. So a, a light that has very small uh, or no diameter is going to cast a very harsh shadow. If you increase the diameter, you'll see your shadows are going to get softer and softer because it's going to diffuse that light more. So keep that in mind. And also that's going to make a really uh, important visual choice to our hair once we set up our hair shader. So that's the thing about hair is that lots of different things interact to create the final result and lights are one of those things. So now we have uh, just a basic light set up in our scene. This is good enough to get our shader set up. Now on the right hand side, you'll see we have materials and we can set up different materials. So I'm going to create a new material with the plus sign and I'm just going to name it hair. You can just double click on the name and it lets you rename it. I'm going to name it hair. You'll see that you have all these different properties for materials. And uh, if this is your first time using Marmoset or you've never used Marmoset, I encourage you just to take some time and play with those, you know, slide things around, break things, just familiarize yourself with the way materials work in Marmoset. Uh, because it'll be a lot easier to know what to adjust going forward. And uh, the first thing we need to do is that 
If you remember when we set up our substance project, we decided to do spec gloss. So by default, all the materials are metal roughness. And I'm just going to go ahead and choose specular. So under reflectivity, we have to change metalness to specular. And under the microsurface, we have to change roughness to gloss. And that's going to give us spec gloss. And it's going to read our texture maps correctly when we export out of Substance Painter. You'll also see that each uh, property of your material has a texture map slot. So we can start loading in some of our texture maps. Um, I have just some very basic ones that I, I did before we start texturing. So we can load in our normal map. If you have a gloss or spec map already, you could load those in. But don't worry, we're going to make those in a little bit. And the albedo, which is our diffuse. So you have that. And um, we're in pretty good shape. Now, the key distinction that we have to understand about hair is that hair has anisotropic properties. Usually by default, with materials and specular in 3D, you have what's like a bling or a bling fong, and that's kind of just your round highlight that hits the surface and then bounces off. With hair, it's what's called anisotropic, and I don't want to get into like the material science properties because I'm going to say something that is wrong and something that's out of my breath, but for the purposes of uh, artistic interpretation, anisotropic is basically the way that the spec kind of lines around a surface. So hair, for example, will have a spec that bands around. Instead of a spec just being a round spot, it kind of rolls around the surface, similar to like satin and other materials. To attempt to give somewhat of a definition to anisotropic, it's that the physical properties of the material are different in different directions. So where a blin has an equal specular in any direction, a anisotropic has stronger spec along one axis than it does against another. So that's the basics. Um, I'm not an expert. Google it. What we need to do is set up our material for anisotropic. The way we do that is by going to the reflection material property in our material and changing it from GGX to anisotropic. And you can see as soon as we make that change, it's going to completely swap the way the specular renders on our hair. And you can kind of see the way that we talked about earlier, the band of spec that's kind of wrapping around. So it's already looking a lot better but you'll also notice it's a bit chaotic. Some of the pieces have the spec way lower, others have it way higher. And this is where that flow map comes in to bring some order to our anisotropic material. And you can see, as soon as we plug in our flow map or direction map, the spec suddenly becomes cohesive and starts rolling along the surface in a similar direction. And that's because we took the time to build that map. Now, there are some ways around this, right? If your hair is all UV'd in one very consistent direction, uh, for the most part, you might be able to just play with the angle, the anisotropic direction angle slider, and get it to look pretty good and be fine. You know, if you really want to dial it in, or if you're trying to have something that's going to look good from every angle, you're probably going to want to create that flow map. Now, and like I mentioned earlier, you can see that our, the tips of our hair have some weird issues, and those are baking issues that we could fix and we should fix with our bake. But when you're lazy like me, you can work around it, and that's what I'm going to do. And I'll show you that in a little bit. With the anisotropic, you can adjust the intensity. You can see that when we crank up the intensity, the spec becomes really tight and really hot. As we drag it down, it becomes more diffuse and spreads out. Now we could just find a happy medium and just leave it at that and be like, okay, it looks pretty good. And then adjust our gloss and our spec to also kind of dial it in. Uh, but the truth is you can actually get an even better result by using a few more properties available to us in the material. This is a very common trick even in other engines. What you actually want is two separate specs that you can control independently of each other. So this one is going to be our primary anisotropic highlight and we're going to make it brighter and hotter and it's going to be the tight one that wraps around. But we're going to use what's called the clear coat options to create a second more diffuse spec that is just a larger area and less hot area of the surface that gives us a little bit more control. And these properties I think are used for carbon fiber or for car paint, things like that, anything that might have a clear coat on top. 
but we can exploit it for hair. And so if you scroll down, you'll see we have all these extra options. There's clear coat uh, reflection, clear coat microsurface, and clear coat reflectivity. And these are just basically duplicates of our options above. And we're gonna go ahead and enable them all. So we're gonna choose the anisotropic for the clear coat reflection. And we'll go ahead and plug in our flow map again there. And then we have the other two options and those are just gonna be our spec gloss options just like before and we can repeat that. Now with this one, you can go ahead and turn the intensity down and make it a lot softer. So now you have two different ways to control the spec on your mesh to get the look that you want. You have the hot highlight options that you can adjust and you have the more diffuse highlight options that you can adjust. And this just gives you a lot more control to get a really nice looking hair. And I'm, I'm just using the same maps for both of these. If you really wanted to dial it in or you wanted to do something crazy, you could make a separate set of texture maps for the clear coat options, but I'm using the same ones and then just using the sliders to tweak it a little bit and get the result that I want. Now that you have all of the options, you can spend some time really dialing in the material properties of your hair. I wouldn't worry about going too far at this stage because your textures and your lighting setup is also going to impact that. The amount of diffusion you have on your light sources also affects how sharp your highlights are. So if you have a light source with no diffusion, that highlight's gonna be really sharp. And if you have a light source with a lot of diffusion, that highlight's gonna be less sharp. So oftentimes you have to adjust your materials in conjunction with your light source to get the effect that you want. So if you want really soft shadows, you're probably gonna have to crank up the intensity on your material properties for your hair to get sharp highlights, or if you do want a diffuse look, then you can turn those material properties down. But keep that in mind that everything kind of plays together to get the result that you want, uh, and you and it's gonna really benefit you to be aware of that. So now that we have our scene set up, we can jump back over to Substance Painter and start texturing. Now, if you're completely unfamiliar with Substance Painter, it has a bit of a learning curve, but it's not too bad. I don't think it's as bad as it looks when you first open it, and you're just like, oh, it's kind of like chaos. It's very similar to Photoshop, and since Adobe's bought in it, it's become even more tightly integrated with Photoshop, being able to use Photoshop brushes and stuff like that. So there's a lot of benefits. Now, just like Photoshop or just like anything, you can work very destructively or you can work very non-destructively. The artist in us wants to work destructively because we just want to paint and throw strokes down and just kind of build and build and build. But if you let your technical side take over a little bit more and keep some order and balance to your structure on how you build your layers and how you build things, you're going to be able to tweak and modify and edit a lot easier with a lot fewer headaches. And so we're going to try to build up the texture for this hair as non-destructively as, non as possible. This probably isn't going to be a super, super in-depth substance painter tutorial because we're covering so many topics in this video but I'll at least try to give some insight into what I'm doing here at this stage. Now, basically my goal is to set the base color of her hair, add some extra details like edge color and cavity color, probably give it a gradient, dial in the specularity, and that's more or less it. I don't need a ton of little micro detail. I'm not adding like hair grain or anything like that. This is a very simple, stylized, simple, straightforward, looking hairstyle. So to start, I'm going to add a new paint bucket layer. You can just click the paint bucket there at the top of the layer panel. And then I'm going to right click it and add a white mask. And so masks are how you do a lot of stuff non-destructively in Substance Painter. By having a black mask or a white mask, it's going to either 100% influence that layer or not influence it at all. So since this is our base one, I'm using a white mask. It's going to flood the whole thing with color and then I can choose the color that I want. So whenever you choose a layer, whatever option you're selected, all the properties for that are going to be in the bottom. You'll see there's a property panel. Might be different based on the layout of your substance painter, but mine is in the bottom right. And now we can choose the layer where the little paint bucket symbol is, and then we can scroll down to the properties and change the color. I'm thinking like a purple or maybe like a black with a purple gradient. I haven't quite decided yet, but for now we're going to choose a purple. And you can see we also have the specular values. So we can choose the glossiness, we can choose the spec. And at the top of the property panel, you'll see all of the options for your different channels are selected. So as you add more layers, not every layer has to influence every channel. So if you want the base layer to be what your specular values are, 
you can go up on your other layers and turn off spec gloss and it will only affect your diffuse, for example. So that's something to keep in mind when you're building your layers in Substance Painter. Now I'm going to go ahead and make another fill layer. I'm going to set this to a darker color and I'm going to add a black mask by right clicking and choose add black mask this time instead of a white mask. So that means nothing's influenced. And then we're going to use a generator to influence what we want. Now to do that, you right click on the mask in the layer panel, go down to generators, and I'm going to use a 3D linear gradient. And this is going to create a gradient mask. So when you're thinking about Substance Painter, we could do this right on top of the color itself, but it's not going to be a mask. Um, I like using masks because it's cleaner, it's easier to edit, uh, and it just makes more sense to me. So I recommend using masks when you're building stuff up, even if it's something simple. Now, if we want, we can adjust the specular values on our new gradient independently of our base layer. Um, and that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have it be more shiny up top and less shiny down below. And that's just a stylistic choice. I think it's gonna help focus uh, the visual interest around the head rather than distracting with the bottom of the hair. That's not realistic, but these are the choices that you're making as an artist to figure out what works best for your composition and what works best for the overall look of what you're trying to go for. Now we can adjust that 3D linear gradient in its properties. So if we click our mask, you'll see that the 3D linear gradient is an option underneath the mask. And if you select that, it has its own set of properties. So you can adjust the balance and the contrast, and that's gonna kind of move the gradient up or down. You even have normal colors. And if you mess with those normal colors, it'll even adjust the position of the gradient. So by default, the gradient is top down, but if you wanted it to be horizontal or at an angle, you can play with those colors to move the gradient around. Um, we don't need to do that in my case. So we're just gonna leave it as is and adjust the balance until we get the right balance and fall off that we want for our gradient. Anytime that you're trying to have a better understanding of what you're doing with gradients in your 3D viewport or your UV panel, there's a little drop down menu in the top right and you can isolate a channel. So by default, we're looking at the entire result of the material. But if you wanna look at just the diffuse or just the spec or just the gloss, or just the mask, you can choose mask and just get a black and white image of your mask to really understand what it's doing. Next, we're gonna add some curvature detail. So we're gonna add another fill layer and I'm gonna add a black mask and then I'm going to use a curvature generator. So I'm gonna to go to generator and I'm gonna choose curvature. Now the curvature generator is kind of all encompassing. It lets you either isolate the edges of something, it lets you isolate the cavities of something, um, there's options there. We're going to isolate the edges and I think that's what the default is, but you can go in and play with the balance, the blur and the contrast. And I recommend you going in and, and choosing the mask layer in your 3D viewport so you can really see what's happening. And I'm just going to play around with the settings till I'm kind of grabbing the edges in a way that I want and kind of just grabbing the detail in a way that I want. So now you can see if we switch to our material, those edges are really, really obvious. So I'm going to go ahead and choose a color that kind of brings them down a little bit. And um, I might even play with the opacity. Uh, you can if you want. And then you can decide if you want your edges to have uh, separate specular values than the underneath. Sometimes if you really want your edges to pop, you can give them a little hotter spec. Um, and really what we're doing here by isolating the edges is really, really reinforcing the geometric shape of our planes. So it just kind of gives us an extra little hit of interest and highlight uh, as we look around our model versus if we didn't have those edges selected. And uh, what I realized is that I don't want the edges to be as prominent on the lower half of my hair. Now there's a couple ways to do this. Um, I could have made a folder and had that folder have a gradient mask in it. And then once my curvature was inside it, it would have just already masked it out. Um, I didn't think of that for whatever reason as I was making this. So I just added another 3D gradient on top of my curvature layer and set it to multiply. And that way it blocked out the curvature detail on the lower half of the model. And then I just kind of played with the settings. So there's lots of different ways you can do things. And ideally you want to do things as efficient as possible, because if you're working in a scene that has lots of materials and lots of layers, it can get really chunky. So this probably wasn't the most efficient way. It's probably best to work in layers, have a folder with a mask, and then build layers inside. And that's gonna have the least amount of nodes that you need to create a result. But this was fine um, for this simple setup.
Next, I'm going to add another fill layer. I'm going to add a black mask and then I'm going to do a ambient inclusion generator. And this is going to let us just isolate the shadows and the pits of our model a little bit. And I can either give it a darker color or maybe a darker color with a little bit of tint to it just to add some more interest and variety. Uh, you have options there. Um, we're just kind of building up the depth and values of our hair to give us different levels of interest. So now let's talk about the tips that were giving me some weird specular issues due to baking errors. This is my way to fix it for this purpose. Uh, I do think you should probably actually fix your bake to not have these weird errors, uh, but sometimes you can't avoid them or they just take too much time and you need to move on. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add another fill layer, add a black mask, and then I'm gonna add a paint modifier to that. And I'm actually just gonna paint the tips where they look like they were acting really weird. And I'm going to disable all of the channels except for uh, spec and gloss. And I'm just going to turn the spec and gloss all the way off. So basically there's going to be no spec on the tips of the hair. And that way you won't see the weird baking issues because there's going to be no highlights to really emphasize uh, what's happening. Just a note about painting uh, in substance. By default, the alignment is like projection based and that could result in you accidentally painting areas or behind where you're trying to paint by mistake. So you can go down in the properties and choose alignment and set it to UV mode. And I find that gives you much better results in terms of painting and kind of keeps you from accidentally painting on areas that you're not trying to. That's pretty much it for texturing the hair. You know, I might tweak things a little bit or emphasize the spec um, and adjust stuff as I'm setting up in Marmoset. But those are the foundational layers that I've created to texture this and I kept it really simple. I did end up going to ZBrush and actually sculpting in some extra kind of strokes and variation on the hair because I felt like it was a little too flat. Uh, I only did that on the front pieces because I knew that I was only gonna do a static image and I didn't worry about the other parts. Probably would have gone back and sculpted that more all the way around the head if this was for a finished game model, or I would have lived and learned and known that I need to go back and create curve brushes that have more detail in them because these ones are too basic and I felt like I needed more. And the reason I sculpted those in is because they just add more visual interest to your anisotropic highlight. So instead of it being so smooth, the more kind of rough uh, 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 lines that you have through your model, that's gonna affect the way it, it looks. And that's what's gonna give you that kind of zigzaggy, wavy, anisotropic look that really sells the look of hair. I um, mean, there's different ways. You could even kind of texture it in, but uh, this was my solution for this specific project. All right, lastly, let's just talk a little bit about my setup scene inside Marmoset. Now, a lot of this is very subjective and just takes a lot of playing around with settings to get what you want, but I'll show you a bit of my thought process and how I arrived where I did for my scene and my final render. First, let's talk about the camera. The camera is pretty straightforward. There's a lot of settings you can play with, but the main settings that I adjusted was the focal length, which I used a 50 millimeter lens. If you're into photography, you'll know that 50 millimeters is a really good portrait focal length. And so that's what I chose. I'm also using the ray trace depth of field. You can see under focus here, we have ray traced and sticky focus, and you can just kind of click where you need to focus and then adjust the settings from there. For tone mapping, I chose Reinhard. I am using ray tracing. So under the render setting up here, I have ray tracing turned on. And then that's why you see when I move the camera, it has to recalculate the ray tracing. Now this isn't really like a game ready kind of scene because this is very advanced ray tracing, but this is just a still render and I wanted to make it look really good. So we used ray tracing. Let's talk a little bit about my light setup. Now for my light setup, I first chose a HDR that I thought was a good ambient light source. And I found this blue sky and I basically just took that, turned down the brightness until I felt like it was a good kind of bounce, soft illumination uh, without being the key lights in the scene. Now I knew I wanted this to be a very stylized looking render. And so my lights are very colorful and bright. I have a key light here, that's skylight one, and it's this bluish tone with a pretty soft diameter. And remember when we talked about earlier how the diameter matters? both in terms of your shadows and how your highlights look on your hair. So if we drag this diameter down, you can see how hard my shadows get. And you can also see as I crank it up, how it changes the highlight on my hair. And so your light and your hair material have to work in conjunction with one another 
to get a really convincing and a really nice result. So you're going to have to play with that to kind of find what works. Now we can adjust this way up and then go to our hair material and compensate for that by playing with the anisotropy here and both of our settings that we've talked about. So you kind of have to play with both of those. Let's undo. My second light is a light behind her just to kind of illuminate the scene and add some color. I have a third light, which is a fill on her left side, just a really bright pink light. And then I have a very subtle white light that just fills in some areas behind her and uh, just kind of extra bounce light. For my material, it's pretty basic. It's basically what we set up earlier. We have the normal map, the direction map, the gloss map, spec map, and then all of those maps again in the clear coat channels. And I just played with the settings to basically get a result that I thought looked good for this render. You can see we have the spec intensity that we can turn up or down. We have the anisotropic properties that affect the overall shininess of the hair. We also have the gloss, and then we have all those settings again for the clear coat. Now, obviously there's also skin and eyes and other materials in here. I would love to go over that stuff, but that's not really this video. This video is already long enough just looking at hair. So if you're interested in seeing some other aspects of this scene, we can maybe do that in another video. That pretty much wraps it up for my scene. I know that it's not super in depth. A lot of this is just artist preference and playing with settings and seeing what works. You know, I recommend getting your basic material set up and then start playing around with the lights. And then once you kind of start finding a light setup and a light rig that you like, you can adjust your materials a little bit more, adjust your lights a little bit more. And it just becomes this back and forth in tweaking the material, the lights, the render settings, the camera, and just whittling away, whittling away until uh, you're happy with the result. All right, guys, I think that's going to wrap up this one. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you were able to learn something. I know we kind of breezed over some topics, but this was a lot to cover. So if there are more specific things or elements that you would like clarity on or like a separate video on, go ahead and leave me a comment in the comment section below and, and give me some feedback. I hope you like this kind of content. If you do, please consider subscribing. I'm back. I know I haven't made videos in a while, but we should get back on a regular schedule here going forward. Again, thank you so much for supporting the channel and I'll see you next time. Take care.